Elton, thank you for letting us come into your home and to go back 60 years. So we have a lot of people out there who would like to hear some of your memories of that time. It's March today, March 7th, 2024. And we're in the home of Felton Henderson in Berkeley. Yeah. And we are going to take a visit back into time. To June, we'll start at June 11, 1963. And three things happened on that day is the reason I want to take you back there and then get your memories. First on that day, the University of Alabama was integrated for the first time. Vivian Malone and James Hood were admitted. They were both African-Americans, both admitted. George Wallace stood in the doorhouse way and yielded to the greater pressure, force, and authority of the federal government. Mm -hmm. Your friend, Deputy Attorney General Katzenbach, led the way, National Guard behind him. That was on June 11th. That evening, President Kennedy went on national TV and made, or I think is his best domestic policy speech. It was on the issue of civil rights. And he said uh, quite a number of things. He called for the passage of a civil rights bill. He said, in part, I'll just read two sentences. It ought to be possible, in short, for every American to enjoy the privileges of being an American without regard to his race or his color. In short, every American ought to have the right to be treated as he would wish to be treated, as one would wish his children to be treated. But this is not the case. One of his best speeches. It was. The third thing is the terrible assassination that evening of Medgar Evers. Mm -hmm. You know a lot about all three of these things. I'd like to start with where you were on June 11th, 1963, and what you your memories of President Kennedy's speech. Okay, yeah, I was uh, with a group of uh, lawyers from the Civil Rights Division in, in 1963. Uh, it's hard to believe it, but there were 37 lawyers in the justice in the civil rights division then i was with about 15 of us uh who were eagerly awaiting the speech we had known it was coming uh the president and his brother bobby kennedy had consulted with burke marshall and john door the director and the first assistant uh about the what the contents of the speech and the important areas to cover and John Doerr, in particular, had talked to us a lot about it. So we were eagerly awaiting it to see what he was actually going to say. And it wasn't clear up until the time we heard it because there was a lot of pressure on him. He struggled mightily with the idea of how aggressive he could be on civil rights because back then, of course, the South was Democrat and he was depending upon their votes and he was worried about the impact it would have on him being elected. So we were eagerly awaiting just where he would, how far he would push it. And uh, do you remember where? What were you at the Justice Department when you saw the speech? No, it was at one of the fellows' homes, and I've tried to remember. I can't remember which one. I think it was Frank Dunbar, who was the head of the Louisiana unit. So there you are, fifteen of you. Mm -hmm. watching President Kennedy on a, probably a grainy old black and white right. TV. That's right. Uh, and and it's it's not a long speech, but it's 20 minutes uh, or so. Uh, were you inspired by that speech? I was. I was. I was pleased with the outcome of it. I thought I was worried that it would be kind of a mild speech to appease the black community, but really didn't have any substance. So I was very pleased with the substance that he had in and the real sense of urgency that he injected into the speech. And I think most of the guys were, too, or all of us, 
were pleased with it. I had read uh, that his advisors advised him uniformly not to give that speech. Yeah. Not to ask for a civil rights bill until after the election. Right. Uh, and uh, he was inspired by the peaceful integration that at the University of Alabama that was so unlike what had happened just a few months earlier at Ole Miss. That's right. Uh, and that uh, so inspired, he said, no, we're going to do it. And they wrote that speech mm -hmm. in one afternoon. Ted Sorensen wrote that speech right. in one afternoon, and he delivered it at night. Do you think that's the way it came down? or that's, that's your memory? Yeah, that's, that's my understanding of the way it came out, right. Uh, all right, so then the uh, we wake up the next morning to the terrible news mm -hmm. about med grabbers. Tell us what you were, your memories about that. Well, I remember hearing about it. Uh, at this point, as I said, I was in Washington, and I had been with Medgar, I think, no more than a week before. I spent in, in Jackson, Mississippi, working on some voting rights matters of my own there. So I was stunned by it. I was a huge admirer of Medgar's and his family. I'd been to their house several times, and uh, he was a hero of mine, and I was just stunned when I read that. And of course, I knew what was going to happen, uh, because every time there was a, something like that in the South, uh, they would fly me back when the 14th Street Baptist Church was bombed. I had to fly back to Birmingham, and th that's what happened here. They flew me back to Jackson, uh, and I spent the next week or so there through Medgar's funeral, uh, talking to people and assessing the black community response to it and trying to get a sense. The office the president was always interested in how volatile these situations were and how likely they were to erupt into violence and just, you know, gunfire and, and, and people getting killed. And one of my jobs was to give him uh, a, as accurate an assessment as I could of, of those matters. That's the, and that leads to the story many of our listeners will have heard, but others would not, will not have. And, and that's the, after the, funeral, hmm. the black, the, I don't know, not students, but residents mm -hmm. were up in arms and were going to, not in arms, but mad, Man. and they were going to march down to the Capitol mm -hmm. or City Hall, and you and John Doerr saved the day from what would have been a bloodbath, mm -hmm. like, the, like what happened at Selma. Yeah. Uh, was, tell us about that one more time. Okay, but to correct it a bit, John Doerr saved the day. I was on the other end. I was walking back from the funeral with the black crowd from the funeral. John Doerr wasn't in that crowd. He is already ahead, and he was over where the police were standing to block our way and stop the procession. So uh, and I was far from a hero, in fact because Medgar had told me several times that one of the things that the police do in Jackson is fire a warning shot to blacks at waist level, he would say. And I noted that, and I found myself walking at the head of this crowd, and when we came upon the police, I immediately remembered that uh, they fire warning shots at waist level and I started, I was the coward there. I was sort of worming my way back into the crowd because I knew there was going to be a confrontation. And lo and behold, as I'm doing that, I hear this voice from the other end. John Doerr steps out into the middle of the street and says, stop, uh, my name is John Doerr. To the crowd, he's shouting it. And he had the habit of spelling his name, D-O-A-R, and we always ribbed him about that, spelling his name at that moment. And everyone who knows me here knows I stand for what's right. And he gave this speech. 
and calmed everyone down. Everybody who knew him said, oh, that's John Doerr, and he had great credibility in the black community. And uh, he stopped what would have been a slaughter. Uh, I'm sure that I have no doubt that there would have been gunfire, that there would have been charging of the police. And but, uh, but you were right there. You heard every word. I heard every word. I was right there when it all happened. I saw it calm down. I was with John a little later on when President Kennedy called him, because this was on TV, called him to congratulate him for what he did and how the bravery of it all. And uh, you have on your wall a uh, New York Times story from that week, June 17, 1963, mm-hmm. and your name is mentioned in it. Uh, the head is Millington C. Groves in Jackson Drive, and then it describes on the front page of the New York Times mm-hmm. just what you've uh, described, uh, and it has you there with equal billing with John Doerr. I, <laughs> <laughs> they were kind to me there, yes. Well, you say you slunk back in. You were a hero, mm-hmm. Delton. We all know that, so. Oh. Well, that was June 11th, and then uh, what did you think the passage chances were for the Civil Rights Bill in the summer of 1963? I thought fair. I, I, I wasn't optimistic about it. Uh, and uh, I think it says something about me, because as I was thinking about what I might say here, I think this kind of pessimism runs through me because years later I was pessimistic about whether this country was ready to elect a black president. I was predicting that Obama would not be elected because this country isn't ready for it. And so that was in 63, I had that same pessimism about the readiness of our country to do something like the the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Well, your pessimism, I think, according to the history books, was Mm well-founded at that point. uh, There had been many efforts made in the 20 years before to pass a Civil Rights Bill. Right. And in every case, the South, Southern senators had blocked it. Right. Uh, and not, not to mention the problems in the House, but uh, so yet uh, President Kennedy thought he had some chance, mm-hmm. uh, else he wouldn't have taken that gamble. Exactly. So you got to admire him for that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I admire him. And uh, yeah, it was a gutsy thing to do. I want the people out there to see this nice picture of Delton Henderson in 1962 and three. Mm-hmm. And this was him at the Justice Department, Maine Justice, as we call it, yeah. in Washington, D.C. It's one of the finest pictures I've seen of you. <laughs> so I, I brought my copy of this book so that we could uh, show that. Uh, well, then uh, President Kennedy was assassinated in mm-hmm. November. Right. And our new president, Lyndon Johnson, came in. And he gave a speech uh, just three days or so. It was the Wednesday after the assassination. Mm -hmm. And he said uh, the best way, just to the Joint House uh, and Senate, and the best way we could remember our fallen president would be to enact Mm -hmm. the Civil Rights Bill that he sent down Mm -hmm. to Congress. And I did see this for sure. There was an amazing moment where there was a standing ovation in the hall Mm -hmm. as if to express a moment of national will that, by God, we're going to pass this civil rights bill. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that moment, and did you see that on television? And if so, what was your reaction? I do remember it, and uh, I I thought... Uh, in the in the in the wake of that awful tragedy of Kennedy being assassinated, that who better than Johnson, the consummate politician, the consummate arm twister, uh, the consummate Southerner? He was a Southerner, and I think that 
weighed heavily in his ability to uh, send a message to uh, the South uh, that he was going to follow up and see that uh, the bill that President Kennedy wanted passed would, in fact, be passed. He was a powerful figure in that. It was very inspiring. I, I, and uh, yeah, I thought so too. And I, and as you say, he was a Southerner, so you'd have plenty of grounds to. All of those people from Texas, sometimes they don't count themselves as Southerners. Right. They like to think of them as Westerners, but nonetheless, the truth is he had allied himself with Richard Russell and James Eastland, all those uh, Harry Bird, all those uh, diehard conservative right. uh, in the South. And and here he was now being vigorous. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that he was serious about it. He was serious, and that was a pleasant surprise. He was not only serious, I think, and this is just a guess on my part, that he saw this as he wanted this to be his legacy. I think this was, and indeed in a way it is, but although it is rightly attributed to Kennedy as starting it, but he carried it on and he brought it to fruition. And in fact, not only the Civil Rights Bill in 64, but the Voting Rights Bill in 65, and then the Fair Housing Act in 68. 68. And right. So he, he was... I think he was, you're right, talking that he, he was, that was his legacy. Yeah. And uh, and he got something through Congress that most people would have said had no chance. Exactly. He was the consummate politician. You know? the, uh, do you remember the, that period? And first it got through the House. It was not easy because you had to get past the Rules Committee. Right. But finally it got past the house and it was in the senate and then the filibuster started yeah i think it's the longest filibuster it in was, senate history i think 75 days is it? something like that yeah. yeah very long and uh it needed two-thirds mm -hmm. for what's called cloture right. and there wasn't enough democrats to of course the democrats were southern democrats were doing the filibuster mm -hmm. so the uh, Everett Dirksen, Republican from Illinois, came to the rescue. Right. Tell us what you remember about that. Well, I remember I was a great, I hadn't thought of Dirksen in any significant way until that, but he did a masterful job of getting the Republican votes in, uh, and I, I ended up as a great admirer of him and uh, over the years uh, that he uh, you know, I think you couldn't have done it without him. If he had been against it, I think it wouldn't have gotten those votes. So I'm a great admirer of Dirk Dirksen, and I don't know anything about his past, but I was surprised that he put the energy uh, and was so successful on it. He was from a state that's known as the land of Lincoln. Right. And it was the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation. I think that weighed on his conscience. Probably so. That's... And so he said something like, this is an idea whose time has come. Mm -hmm. So he got behind it. Yeah. And I think the first pen that President Johnson gave on the signing, mm -hmm. first pen went to Everett Dirksen. It did, yeah. And Martin Luther King got one too. Right. But Everett Dirksen got the first pen. I forget the number, but I think Johnson had something like 60 or 70 pens. <laughs> That, that day that he gave to various people. So that was in July 64. That gets passed. And give us your view, um, maybe not immediately, but in the next few years, what difference impact did the Civil Rights Act have? I think it had a, a huge impact on, on morale of the black community, minority communities, and it, it, it did change a, a great impact upon discrimination as such. Uh, it uh, made an inroad into the Jim Crow laws. It eliminated many of the Jim Crow laws. So the white only signs came down. No, uh, you could sit at the lunch counter. You could ride at the front of the bus. 
it changed all of those kind of things having to do with discrimination. And it was a great uplift for the black community. It encouraged them. It also encouraged other groups to get activists. Women, uh, the National Organization of Women, now formed about a year after that as a part of that impetus. Uh, disability, disabled people uh, got active. Uh, elderly got active. A uh, gay community got more active. It started a uh, drive in that direction that really affected our country much, much beyond race. Let's take uh, one example of from. Uh, let's take public accommodations. Mm -hmm. And you, I've read in your, in this book and other places, uh, uh, your, the story before and after concerning your ability as a black mm -hmm. to check into a hotel. Mm -hmm. Tell us the before and the after. Oh, boy. Okay. The, the, the dramatic story, and you might remember this happened uh, when uh, we were at the University of Mississippi uh, uh, with, with following your, the book that you wrote. And uh, I wanted my wife, Maria, to see the places I had worked when I was with the Justice Department. So I took her along. And after our, our appearance in, in Oxford, uh, we decided we were going to visit all the spots in Mississippi and in Alabama. So I went to one of those spots. We drove to this hotel in uh, Alabama. And this was a hotel that in 1963, uh, John Doerr and I were in town and he called me. I, I had to stay at the A.G. Gaston Motel because that's the only place blacks could stay. And he was at a white hotel. And he wanted some papers on this voting right case we were working on. And he asked me to bring them to him. So I had on my suit and tie and a briefcase. And I walked into the lobby of the hotel. And I guess I made the mistake of walking in with a briefcase and a suit as if I belonged there. And they all but attacked me and ran me out of the lobby. Get out of here. What do you want? N-word. And I left, and I had to go down the street and call John Doerr to come outside and get the papers that I wanted to deliver to him. And so here I am a number of years later with my wife, and we go into that same hotel I wanted to show her. And who's behind the desk but black employees? Who's in the dining room but blacks eating? And it was just amazing, amazing experience for me to just see that. And I saw it throughout the South as I traveled with uh, my wife, who is Mexican. Uh, but I was even worried as I went, just on my, those horror years when I was there, with so much racism, how that would be treated, walking down the street with a woman who appeared to be white. Uh, but it was a huge change, and uh, was gratifying to see it. And I visited a lot of people. I met people there that were, you know, lived a different life than their earlier people had lived in 1963. That's a good story. You mentioned our visit to Ole Miss. Uh, it was quite a contrast. They, don't you think we were both treated wonderfully by the people at Old Miss? We were. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. And I've told the story many times. Uh, as I walked around campus the next day or previous or the earlier in the day of their event, uh, literally there were more blacks walking around the campus of Ole Miss than are walking around the campus of the University of California at Berkeley. That, that, that uh, was, that, there's no doubt that's true. Yeah. That's also true at my, uh, where I went, at Mississippi State. Uh, that's, a, that's a very uh, astute observation. Uh, and now compare that to 1962 when James Meredith okay. tried to enroll there and there were terrible riots, mm -hmm. and one guy was killed, a newspaper man from France right. was killed. Uh, it was awful, but huge, 
uh, just an awful uh, event. And yet, uh, six months later at the University of Alabama, peaceful, the students behaved, uh, even though George Wallace did not. And then, uh, then fast forward after all these years, uh, you are welcomed as a hero at, mm. at Ole Miss. So mm. give us another example of how the Civil Rights Act did something good for the country. Uh, let's take the area of employment. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the before and the after on the Civil Rights Act? Yeah, no, it made a huge difference in employment, the kind of jobs that blacks could get, and also the the elimination of barriers to getting those jobs. Uh, and uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on that I think relates to your question is that... Uh, uh, blacks were emboldened. The word was out. And so blacks, just as they were emboldened to try to register to vote, uh, they were emboldened to try to look at jobs, look for jobs, and feel entitled to jobs that previously they wouldn't even try to get. And so the employment went up, uh, and uh, there, there was a lot of change in the black community in terms of what they were capable of doing. So it, it was a huge change. So let's focus uh, now on things that uh, unfinished business, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, areas in our economy, areas in our national life that the Civil Rights Act has not cured. So let's let's look. We've already we focused on some of the positives. Yeah. Uh, let's focus on some of the unfinished business. Yeah. So what what's your view on that? Subject. Well, I think that uh, the the Civil Rights uh, Act of '64 eliminated uh, or led the way to the elimination of Jim Crow laws and laws of discrimination. As I said earlier, whites only kinds of activities. What it didn't do was work on racism itself. So racism still persisted. And the effects of racism, it didn't work on that. And one critic uh, said that, uh, for example, uh, it uh, was like w without working on the economics of the black community, it was like starting a black in a 50-yard dash 10 yards behind and ask, ask, expecting him to run and compete. Uh, it didn't address those problems, and I think those problems, to a large measure, still still exist. Uh, the really deep embedded problems, so that uh, right now, today, uh, there's twice as much black employment as white uh, uh, unemployment as white unemployment. It didn't address the economic and the poverty of the black community or minority communities. And I think that remains to be solved still. It's a probably deep problem. And a more worrisome thing that I, I see now happening, that I saw starting to happen and I think still exists, is that uh, those, those who were against the Civil Rights Bill and were critics of it used the failure of the black community to now rise. Okay, no more discrimination. You're just like us. You said, but they weren't, and they didn't still have all of the opportunities. And they used that to say, see, it wasn't racism at all. It's the inadequacies of the black community that is holding them back. So that sort of became part of the the, the criticism of the Civil Rights Bill and of the black community. And uh, we went into an era of colorblindness because and reverse discrimination. And uh, I, I see some of the gains then uh, receding a bit with this kind of thing. And Reagan uh, advanced it, and I think Nixon did, so that... Uh, we start uh, 
Uh, it led to the move from mass incarceration, uh, which we have now. And I, one of my biggest cases in the 37 years I was on the bench was dealing with the overcrowding in the California jails and fighting that problem. So I think uh, Martin Luther King uh, often said that uh, the, the history of the civil rights movement is two steps forward and one step backward. And I think right now we're maybe taking two steps backward uh, because of all of those things that I've mentioned. Again, the, wouldn't you, okay, agreeing with that, but wouldn't you say that the passage of the 64 Act was hit at least 10 steps forward? Oh, yeah, no uh, question about it, right. 10 steps forward. It was 15 steps forward. I can beat you on that one. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. It was historic. It was monumental. Uh, and uh, it, it was, it was, uh, it was major. And, uh, King said so uh, when, at the time that it was passed. One subject that I don't think the act uh, directly addressed was education. Okay. Give us your grade on how America has handled education. Uh, again, I think poorly. Uh, I think that, uh, again, it's tied again to the economics so that... Uh, well, the economic problem, blacks live in ghettos, uh, not by choice, sometimes by law, but also to the economics of it. That's the only place they can afford to live. And uh, the schools in those areas are underfunded. Uh, the teachers are uh, less prepared, I think, and uh, it just works against them. I think that's, a, that's a, one of the biggest problems is that the economics, they, they're still poverty-stricken and there need to be things that will lift them there. But we have people calling blacks on welfare because they have no other out, you know, uh, welfare queens. And there's a, been a movement against uh, things that will aid blacks. And, uh, you know, and even uh, affirmative action, which... Uh, was a big fight. I think I got help in on the along the way before it was called affirmative action, but it's been a big boost. But that's on the decline now, and it's even uh, be, being called revert to discrimination. The Supreme Court uh, just a few months ago said Harvard could not do that. Right, uh, exactly. Could not use race and uh, yeah admissions policies. Yeah, and I think that's a big step back. It's just. Uh, and uh, to call it reverse discrimination is just unrealistic. Uh, if you are going to realize the 1964 Civil Act, uh, Civil Rights Act, I think you not only need to uh, stop uh, discrimination, uh, but you need to also delve into the effects of racism. And these are the residual effects of racism that still hold us back as a nation where everyone is equal and has equal opportunity. One last question. <laughs> uh, what advice do you have for America on how to move forward on the issue of race? That's, that's a tough one, I did, and it's probably as idealistic, but I think... Uh, we have to realize that we're all in this together, uh, this country, to move forward, especially now. The United States is no longer uh, so far ahead in the world in terms of its standing in the world, its power in the world, as it was back in 1963. And uh, one of the uh, impacts of, of the racism thing is that, and it's playing a role, I think, in the upcoming election with Biden and what appears to be Trump, is that uh, the white community, the poor rural white community, is up in arms now about their treatment. And uh, they're saying, we need the kinds of things that you're giving blacks. And uh, it's, uh, 
Uh, we need to address the entire problem and not them versus us kind of a thing, but see it as solving the whole problem because it's not just the blacks who are screaming about equality. There are many whites now who are doing it. And I think it's something that we need to address and join together as a national problem and not a racial problem. Elton Henderson, thanks again for letting us come into your home. My pleasure, my honor. Okay.